Hello and welcome to Full Disclosure, a podcast project conceived entirely to allow me to spend more time with interesting people than would ever be allowed or um, endurable on the radio show. Sebastian Fawkes, welcome. Thank you. Nice to be here. Well, thank you. I should start by, I don't know, whining a bit and moaning because as I researched this interview, I realised that before you became a famous author, you had managed to secure precisely the career that I wanted when I first tried to get into journalism. You did that because I did a little bit on the diaries, but yeah. then you moved into literary journalism. I ended up show business editor of the Daily Express, which was a million miles from where I wanted to be. But you, you, you pulled off the dream. You got that lovely little. It's all luck, isn't it? Yes, it's, it's <laughs> I all hope so. luck. I hope so. You could say that. No, it's all luck. I was a very sort of junior diary boy on the Daily Telegraph, which where I got slightly stuck actually for a bit. And then I applied for a job to edit the diary on the Sunday Telegraph. Right. Diaries, and then we're talking about the um, late 70s, early 80s, they, they, they were pretty friendly. There wasn't yes. sort of celebrity divorces and stuff no. like that. Um, but anyway, they didn't give it to me, but they said, we need an extra feature writer. So I then became a feature writer. And being a feature writer on a Sunday paper is just the most wonderful job. It's one <laughs> story a week. You normally go off somewhere quite interesting, either usually it, for me it was somewhere in Britain, but it might be abroad, and you spend uh, two or three days there, come back on Friday evening and rattle it out and have most of the weekend off as well. Fantastic job. Very different era. Yeah, totally. I think my dad was on the Telegraph at the time, and they could do a full, full it was a news report, so you could do a full week on the daily and then do half a morning on a Saturday for, for you know, a for significant extra. chunk of change again yeah, for, for yeah. the new shift. But we jumped far ahead. We shall begin at the beginning. Born in Donington in, in, in Berkshire. It, it sounds like quite an idyllic childhood. I don't know if that's... It was, uh, it was lovely. I mean, we lived in this village which was just very near to Newbury, which is quite a busy town uh, on the, now in what they call the M4 corridor, but the M4 wasn't there in those days. And my dad um, was a lawyer in the local town, and my mum was uh, what we then didn't call a homemaker. And uh, I had an older brother, and we just played a lot in the garden. We played endless games of cricket and football and cowboys and Indians. And, yeah, it was, it was, it was very pleasant. And a, a lot of books due to your mum, I think. Yes, uh, she was. Well, both my parents read a lot. I mean, we had a television, but it was only, I think we only had one channel, and then eventually we got two. But as a conservative voter, you should support the private enterprise channel, not the state run BBC. <laughs> but he was sort of didn't really agree with that. Um, so, yeah, we read a lot. There were tons of books in the house, but um, I wasn't incredibly bookish as a child. It was more playing games, it was more sport, really. And occasionally my mother would say in a rather exasperated tone, I mean, why don't you sit down and read a good, improving book? Well, there's one way to get a child not to read never, it. Never, it's never in a million that phrase. years. It's the last thing you want to do. Your father served in the Second World War. Was that, was that a theme at home? Was that something that cropped up much? Um, it cropped up if you if you dropped um, a saucepan or a glass and it made a loud noise. He had he would sort of jump and then my brother and I would laugh a lot and say, <laughs> "Ah, there's the guns at Anzio," ha ha ha, <laughs> uh, in a rather cruel way. But uh, no, he didn't talk about it, um, and it was just something that had happened. Uh, I mean, my mother was in the WAF, uh, the Women's Air Force, and my everyone I knew just it was just a generational thing our parents had taken some part just as our parents had taken uh, our grandparents rather had been in the first world war though oddly enough my father's father was too old narrowly for the first right. but my mother's father fought in it survived it um, and then was killed in the second world war as a war reporter uh, with the going with the Germans across the Rhine in 1945 so I suppose it was very much in the background um, but I don't, not in any sort of traumatic sense at all. Um, but I just remember dad doing the gardening in his army trousers and one day going off to the local hospital to have a bit of shrapnel taken out of his elbow where it had worked its way down from his shoulder over the years. Must have been at least 10 years more, actually. Um, and very late in his life, he wrote a memoir, um, not for publication, just to get the facts right. I think he. Like a lot of old people, he felt that although it was nice of younger people to be interested in the past mm. and what he had done, uh, we always got the details wrong. So, those, yeah. so it's a very detailed memoir about this is where we landed, this was the ship, and we were in the brigade with these people, the Sherwood Foresters and the King's Shropshire Light Infantry, whatever it was. It was those two, actually. Um, and it was it's very interesting to read now, just just for its precision, but... It's not very it's not very emotive, and he doesn't really try to describe what he felt, though you can read between the lines of it. 
You're, you're quite a meticulous researcher, aren't you? When you're writing in the past. Yes, um, I I sometimes wonder why, really, and I, <laughs> I <laughs> you get to go away a lot, don't you? <laughs> uh, well, I I suppose the truth is I enjoy it. Yes, and I think if you're writing about war and the experience of war, uh, you you are really obliged to try to get it right, uh, to honour those who who went through it and those who died, including your father. Yeah, and um, but. This desire to get everything absolutely right, um, I don't know. There are mistakes and mistakes. I mean, I read an American novel not long ago. Uh, it was written by an American but set in, in England, which I don't think he'd been to very often. <laughs> and he said, on the weekend, we uh, we drove up the M4 to Oxford. And you think, well, you didn't. I mean, you just can't. <laughs> and little things like that can really spoil it if you make yes. sort of obvious errors like that. But on the other hand, I remember being at the, I think, the Cheltenham Festival a couple of years ago. Uh, my last book was called Snow Country yes. and set in Vienna in the first 30 years of the 20th century. And the, the question was, how do you do your research, blah, blah, blah. And uh, I said, well, it's very difficult because of the pandemic. I went to Vienna once before, uh, just before it started, and then I haven't been able to go back. So it's all been books and reading and YouTube and talking to people. And this guy said, but why do you bother? I mean, we don't care which way around the Ringstrasse the traffic went in 1911. Mm. Make it up. You're a good writer. We'd believe you. So there, you know, it's too late now. I've done all this research. <laughs> did you visit anywhere for the clinic in, in Snow Country? Was there, did you? Did you... Um, no, the clinic is um, invented. Though yes, it's... No, but was it based on any sort of... Well, the building is rather modelled on a hotel that okay. I, I knew of. A friend of mine is half Austrian and he has a little house on a lake. And opposite um, the house, it was really a summer house, there wasn't really room to stay in it. Uh, there was this big hotel, and it had a, a central courtyard and lots of buildings with long corridors, which were very atmospheric. And as soon as I went there, this is, must be 25 years ago now, mm. when I was writing a book called Human Traces, I thought, ah, this is the building that I, on which I will base my clinic. And I, I really don't like taking things out of real life very much. I would never have a character in a book who was modelled on someone in real life. Um, but buildings I don't have a problem with. I quite often just sort of steal them. And I mean, obviously, I changed its purpose from being a hotel to a clinic. But in other respects, it's pretty much uh, exactly it. So it's still a hotel? Yeah. I'll get the name of it after us because yes. you recreated it in the in the in Snow Country so completely. I would quite fancied visiting. Really. It's nice, <laughs> uh, the, Leonstein. It's called. It's in a village, uh, a village or town really called Percha, on Lake Vortice in Carinthia. Um, and then to school. So presumably of a, of a class and a generation where being I mean, even the phrase sent away sounds quite brutal, doesn't <laughs> yes. it? But and it's certainly not how people necessarily felt, but you were. Yes, uh, my brother and I were uh, packed off. Uh, it, it was just what I think our parents thought it was the right thing to do mm. um, to a very, um, very old fashioned establishment, I think is the only way to put it. A very strict, very severe and utterly disorientating and terrifying for a small child. Um, but you had to sink or swim and uh, I, I sank a little bit and then I came up to the surface and then I swam and then to be honest I rather enjoyed it it was a very weird world of you know maths and Latin and Greek and not exactly cold showers but you know that That's sort cool. of thing yeah. um, but I, I found that I was able to operate in it and I was I was pretty good at lessons and I loved games so I was sort of I, I don't know whether I was molded by it or whether I fit the mold but one mm. way or the other I was quite happy there. And, and you established pretty quickly. Did you already know you were bright? Did did, did, did teachers at your yes, sort of village I'd, school tell you? Did mum and dad tell you that you Yes, I'd won the sort of form prizes age 6, not that that means very much. And I mean I don't really know how being good at a uh, school work when you're um, a child or a teenager it's not really a much of a predictor about of anything I think. And lots of people who are very talented and have really useful, worthwhile lives and careers develop much later mm. or they, they find what their speciality it is. And then it awakens in them a sort of intellectual capacity, which quite often they didn't know they had earlier on. And, and were you writing stories at all? or? Um, 
I started writing uh, poems actually when mm. I was about fifteen. Okay. Uh, I wrote. Uh, I've never written a short story ever. Um, really? No. It, it's it's the obvious way which you'd think that a yes. novelist would start the shorter form than what you're doing. It, um, I've never written one. So after poetry, I went straight into trying to write a novel when I'd left university when I was, say, 22. Um, and that was really terrible. Um, and well, I hang on a minute. <laughs> we're, 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 we're running ahead of ourselves. I want to go back. After that prep school, you went yeah. to Wellington College. Yeah. Um, and here your academic performance is, if I've read it correctly, a bit extraordinary. No. Did you, not, you did everything early, didn't oh, you? Oh, yeah, that, that, yeah. I mean... Well, not extraordinary to you. No, it was just that uh, in those days you could um, just do exams when they th when they thought you were ready for. Oh, okay. Them. And yes. also, I went in the summer term, so I I went sort of like two years ahead of myself. Plus, I almost missed another year by arriving in the summer. Right. Which was a bit of a mistake, really, um, um, because it meant I was in class with boys who were two years older than me, and. You know the difference between a boy of thirteen and a half and one of nearly sixteen. It's pretty I mean, big. It's quite big, and they yeah. want theirs in motorbikes and girls and hairy and things. Yeah, like that. exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I would have been much better to have dropped back, not two years, but one year anyway. Yes. So it looked as if I could be in and out of that place almost before my voice had broken. You know, mm. <laughs> all being well, which was fine by me because I didn't really like Wellington. It was, it wasn't a very good school in those days. Let me stress, it's mm. now completely different. It's co-ed. It has brilliant academic results. It has lessons in yoga and happiness and self fulfillment. It's a, it's a very fine school now, but it, it wasn't then. Was it austere? Is that what you're saying? It was austere and it was second rate. And okay. it, it sort of were you conscious of its second rate. Even I was, yeah. Really? Because the the school I'd come to before, uh, from from before, if you were good at something, you got a prize and a pat on the back. Yeah. Whereas being good at things at Wellington was considered very dubious. It was considered to be showing off. Or, okay. So the the sort of boy they admired was the one who wasn't much good at anything but didn't make a fuss. <laughs> um, and I suppose this was from 150 years of breeding people to send out to the colonies to live as colonial administrators in difficult circumstances right. um, and not make a fuss. A mid-rank. mid, mid, mid rank and, uh, Yes. Not, not the kind of head of mission. Mm. That's right. Though, of course, actually, um, you know, like all largest schools, there were some clever kids there. Yes. And in, among my contemporaries were some really quite bright people who went on to do, you know, good things. Were, were you lucky? I mean, did you, we haven't mentioned teachers yet. Did you find, did you have any inspirational teachers, any teachers who took you under their wing and... Uh, n not to begin with, no, they were really quite poor, um, <laughs> really quite poor. Um, the bad at communicating and just dusty textbooks and going through the motions. But except in my last year, um, I stayed on a year after A-levels um, to prepare for the Cambridge exam. In those days, you took an exam to get into But you're Cambridge. still young now for this. You're still... I was 16 then. So, yeah. Um, and then in my last year, I did have very good teaching, actually. I had three teachers who taught me English um, and they were all good and they were all you know genuinely excellent actually so that was that was worth it and and if I'd met you then in your final year at school or while you were doing the Cambridge prep and I'd said what do you want to do after university what would you have said I'd have said I want to be a novelist I would mean you, I had already was there yeah I'd already decided that this is what I wanted to do um, I loved English uh, literature and indeed French I, and knocked off a French A-level in the year after as well. And what I liked about it was that by this time I'd become, instead of being the rather swatty little schoolboy captain of cricket, I'd become thoroughly disagreeable, rebellious, um, <laughs> disenchanted. And I, what I loved about all the English, the great English novelists I read was that they too seemed so rebellious and so anti-establishment. Um, you know, D.H. Lawrence... Um, and, you know, even Jane Austen, we think of as this sort of very ladylike conservative woman, but she's not mm. at all, really. I mean, the, the, the aristocrats in her books are always figures of fun, as are the people, you know, churchmen and mm. people of position. Mm. They're always teased for their snobbery and their stupidity. The people she backs are the, the ones who have an understanding of the world in a modest way. Um, but come from quite ordinary backgrounds. And so I, I liked that. I thought how great it could be to to be on the side of the underdog, which is what I felt 
my future should be, fighting for the underdog, but at the same time very respectable. And it was clear that you could you could write these books and you could make a living, but you would be thought to be, you know, within the law and um, you could be respectable and praised and have a nice life. But was it in a sort of environment where that would be greeted with nod- nodding heads? No one would say, don't be ridiculous, you can't be a novelist. Was it... Uh, it, it was. It was. Don't be ridiculous. Yes. It was. Oh, very much so. Right. I mean, I mean, it was a question of: Are you going to the army, or are you going to read law, or did medicine? your dad want you to follow him into the law? Particularly, <laughs> I know your brother did. Um, no, he didn't press me one way or the other. To be fair, um, he he thought I could, I should do what I wanted to do. But you know that if you when you go and see the careers teacher, there was there's no career path to being a novelist. <laughs> and to be to be fair, no one made a living from being a novelist anyway. I right. mean, historically, writers um, survive by being married to or living with someone who makes some money. And you know, when I was growing up, um, first trying to write, the people of a generation older than me. I mean, not <clears throat> Iris Murdoch and mm. Kingsley Amis and Anthony Burgess and people like that. I don't think any of them made a living from their books. Burgess was always going on about being skint in yeah. Little Wilson and Big God and his other yes. biographies, autobiographies. And, you know, and Burgess sold quite a lot of copies, certainly, mm. of, of some of his books. But I, I never had a problem with that. I thought, that's fine. You know, I'll, I'll write part time and I'll teach or I'll be a journalist or I'll have some other job. And my wife, if ever I'm lucky enough to find one, she'll work too. So, you know, we'll manage. And I do think some younger writers today feel quite uh, aggrieved that they're not able to earn, you yes. know, for forty forty five thousand pounds a year to live in a sort of okay way, but they they never have been able to. That's interesting. I was I was staggered the first time I read about how few authors make money for publishers. It's I mean it is a a tiny minority. It's a sort of five ten percent or something as ridiculous as that, which sort of adds to what what what, what you're saying. Libraries yeah. were a big source of income for a long time for, 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 for authors around that time. So you would already then at 18, 17 years old, it, 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 it not just had the ambition, but had the sense of destiny, perhaps. Well, destiny sounds a bit sort of pompous, I mean, but I was very, I was quite determined. Yeah. And I think I was quite perverse. And I quite liked the idea of sticking two fingers up to the world, even to my parents, whom I loved. But um it didn't bother me that they were uneasy about all this. Okay. Yeah. Um, in fact, I, I'm afraid to say I rather I, I rather enjoyed slightly shocking them and their friends and um, growing my hair down to my <laughs> waist and listening to <laughs> terrible prog rock and smoking like a chimney and drinking too much and so on. Um, but I was determined, and I I did I did do the work. I mean, I read lots, and after I'd left university. Uh, I got a job teaching because I had to have a mm. job, but I would get up very early in the morning and write for a bit before going off to work. So it was the real deal. It wasn't a sort of romanticised self-image. Yeah, but I, I found it difficult to to work out what I was doing. So I I, I, I think I'd written, pro, I think I'd finished three novels before the first one. Before I got one into print. Crikey! I just. You know, it was just trial and error, really, figuring out how it worked and reading lots of other books. And I found reading uh, novels that I didn't like or I thought didn't work was very instructive, very helpful, rather than just saying, oh, that's useless. And I was doing a bit of reviewing at this time. I didn't just write a disobliging review. I tried to figure out why it didn't work. And mm. you can, I learned a lot from that, I think. So where, where did you, I mean, so what, where, that said, where did you derive the confidence that you would be good one day, if you like? Um, just a sort of innate confidence, I yeah. suppose, and and I think that having won tons of prizes all through my um, schoolboy career probably gave me a degree of confidence. W- was Cambridge not formative at all? You've glossed over Cambridge. I don't know whether that's just. Um, well, it was comp- it, it was um, it for- formative in a way. Uh, insofar as there was a very serious way of looking at the world and the study of English was considered, which is what I read, very, very serious. And I remember having a disagreement with my supervisor, who was a rather dry man that I didn't get on with very well. Um, And we were talking about Shelley and there was a particular line of verse of his and we talked about it, the ending of the line of verse for about 40 minutes. And I said, you know, at the end of the day, you know, really, (laughs) 
is this more important than ending the war in Vietnam? And he said, yes, it's much more important. Right. So there was that seriousness of outlook, which was I found quite bracing, and yes. quite, actually it's quite stimulating. Uh, my college, Emmanuel, was very, very puritanical, and it had been founded in about 1580, I think, and it was... It was so puritanical that when they had the first chapel, they wouldn't have it facing east-west because there was a symbolism in that. Wow. The east is the altar of the rising sun, S-U-N and S-O-N. So the original chapel was built north-south. And this sort of puritanical um, feeling exists, uh, had persisted in not throughout Cambridge, actually, but very much still in my college. And it was in there in the study of English. And it sounds odd that I was a rather sort of louche undergraduate spending far too much time in the pubs and, you know, smoking marijuana. But on another level, I did, I, I liked this seriousness. And I, I, think, I think I did take it in. And I, met a, I made a couple of very good friends in my college who, who came, my best friend was a guy called Ian Black, who came from Leeds, from a Jewish family. And I suppose our meeting there was rather what these universities are supposed to be like. You meet someone from a different part of the mm. country, from a different background. And it used to amuse him very much how physically we look different. Um, and he used to see me as this sort of southern, softy, fair-haired, and himself <laughs> as this gritty Jewish northern uh, guy. It wasn't really true. But you know, it was, it, what was great was that the grounds on which we met were entirely intellectual. I mean, right. And we just made each other laugh so much. So yes, I mean, I, I, I did get all that from, from Cambridge. And, and so never any temptation of academia or anything like that it wouldn't have been an un unnatural um, ambition or progression yeah I didn't really do enough work well, I didn't right. really do any work actually and um, I did p p toy with the idea of trying to go on and do a PhD or something but I think I'd always had a slightly sort of metropolitan feeling I, and also um, I, I just liked the idea of London the big city and if you go on in academia, it's all very well. You start off in one of these lovely colleges in Oxford and Cambridge, but you're only there for a short while, and then you find yourself in a junior assistant teaching post in a remote and mm. part, and you think, oh, God, what am I doing in the wilds of North Wales or whatever? Mm. Uh, whereas almost everyone I know had um, gravitated towards London. And as soon as I arrived in London, um, I, I just loved it, really, and I've been here ever since. So. They, 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 well, we'll get there in, in two minutes. Just tell me a bit about this year in France, mm. because that, that sounded quite special as well. Which year? Before university. Oh, yeah. In, so you did the, mm. the year off. And, yeah, the year off, as we used to call it. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I went over to Paris, um, and I stayed with a family outside Paris for a couple of weeks, uh, and then I got a room in a flat in Paris. But I was still only 17, and I... I couldn't really speak French, though I had done the A-level, so I got the sort of grammar. Uh, and I just sort of mooched around, really, and uh, I went to art galleries and cinemas all the time, uh, and I read colossal amounts of books I bor borrowed from the American Library in Paris. Um, and suddenly I found I could speak French. I don't quite know how it happened. Mm. I think largely I just imitated a Frenchman. And <laughs> my accent was actually quite good. I mean... We can all do a Scottish or an Irish or an Australian accent. So when I came to speaking, I just, I just said, "Well, I'll, I'll, I'll say these words, but with a very strong French accent." And uh, everyone said, "You know, well, mais vous parlez si bien pour l'anglais, c'est formidable." Uh, and uh, but how I got the words to come out, I don't know. I suppose you're, I'm still young, and your brain can sort of take it in. But I don't really have a natural feeling for language. Um, but no, no, that was so. That was a pretty good um, experience. So I was very lonely. Um, but I mean, I'd hope to go to Paris and, and meet lots of you know exciting girls, and um, and my parents hoped I'd you know learn French, and they got what they wanted. <laughs> they got what they wanted. Fifty <laughs> percent. Yeah. Um, so straight up to London after. There's nothing so far, Sebastian, that suggests a, a, a sort of status anxiety or ambition based upon. Um, unlocking achievements. You, you you knew that you wanted to be a novelist, but yeah. you were quite comfortable living in your vision of the future you would have been quite comfortable living modestly yes i i mean 
I wanted sort of status in so far, insofar as you know most writers are are ambitious mm. um, and they want to be recognised and uh, you know sell lots of copies and be fated and wined and dined. <laughs> so I did have that. I mean, it's it's, it's not something I'm proud of, but you know, one might as well probably be, need it. Yeah, actually, might as well be honest about yes. it. But no, I didn't. Uh, having money and a swanky house didn't bother me. Um, and. You teach. I mean, what did you do? Just reply to an advertisement in a newspaper? Or? Yeah, I did what a million English graduates before me have done. I went to a teaching agency and mm. said, look, I haven't got a qualification. And they said, well, in that case, you'll have to go to a sort of ropey private school. Yes, I said, well, I've just got to have a job because I can't, you know. Um, so I applied for several jobs, um, didn't get any of them. And then eventually I did get a job in a school called the Dwight Franklin International School in Camden Town. Right. And it was in the old uh, Working Men's College, which had been founded by, I'm not sure it hadn't been founded by William Morris, actually, or one of these yeah. great Victorian educators. And uh, during the day, the kids would come in, a lot from all over the world. It rather reflected what was happening in the world. A lot were coming from Iran in the mid-70s, expecting you know, massive change there, as duly happened. Yeah. And most of the English kids were had been either been thrown out or not flourished or whatever in mm. other schools. Um, but actually, although I'm making it sound rather rackety, it wasn't a bad school at all. And, you know, we got them through their O levels and A levels. And those who couldn't speak English properly, they had to be on a different stream, an EFL stream. And again, I made some good friends there. And um, But there was no, so was, I've got clearly no Damascene moment where you thought, I found my true calling. Right? No, I wasn't really a very good, funnily enough, I, I was at an event publicizing my new book. The Seventh Son, and a girl came up to me, and uh, well, I say girl, I've got ahead of myself in the story. A, a woman of uh, nearly sixty came up to me and said, uh, "My name is," and she said what her name was, and then she looked at me and she said, "You taught me when I was eleven." Gosh. And indeed, I said, and she told me what her name was. I'm not going to repeat it in case of it course. embarrasses her. Uh, and I, she said, "Do you remember me?" And I said. I do, and I can tell you what your second name is too. And I told her her long, complicated yes. Iranian second name. She was absolutely amazed. Um, but uh, yeah, it was it was kind of fun. And are you writing in the evenings now? You're, yeah. You're, so these are the two or three novels that precede *A Trick of the Light*. Are, are That's now right. Taking shape. That's right. And did you try to get them published? I tried very hard, but the first one it came whistling back through the post as soon as I could get it out. I mean, <laughs> they were very good at sending it back. Michael Joseph, Chatter and Windus, all of them. Uh, you know, they read it, but they just, it, it was really quite poor. It was a sort of slightly frantic thrashing and floundering around. Um, though the sentences were okay. Mm. And, you know, obviously this... It's not necessarily in the right, right order. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Um, and so I then wrote another one about a cricket match, um, which unfortunately, if you think about a cricket match, there's 22 people. And because it was a book about, you know, human relationships as well, that meant they all had other halves, so that's 44. Then you add in the umpires and the scorers. And the t- <laughs> there was a cast of about 60 people, which for a very inexperienced novelist is very, very hard to manage. Yes. Um, and then eventually I, I sort of thought, I've got to be a bit less ambitious. I've got to write something a bit more focused. And I can write something that you know is, uh, is of interest to me, but nevertheless has a strong plot and a story, which is therefore a little more likely to get published. So A Trick of the Light was um, really, it was a kind of compromise between the sort of pretentious thing that I wanted to write and what I thought the, you know, these ridiculous bean counters would tolerate. Okay, <laughs> so so a consciousness then of trying to be sellable or yeah. publishable at least. Yeah, with that. Yeah. And um, I thought once I got into print, I'd be then free to do what I wanted, which kind of was what happened. Um, because I then wrote a book called The Girl at the Lyon Door, which right. is really the book that I wanted to write anyway. Yes. But it, it, was a, it was a tremendous bit of publishing by um, a company called Bodley Head. And the editor, James Michie, who is no longer with us, but I think he, he realized that A Trick of the Light wasn't a very good book, but he could see promise in it. Mm. Uh, and what publishers do is they invest a small amount of money. I mean, 1,500 quid, so really not a lot, even mm. in by those days, uh, in the hope and belief that your next one will be better. And, you know, he gave me the confidence, and my next one was a lot better, actually. I don't think you realised when you sort of importuned James Mickey to publish it mm. that he was already 
a bit of a legend, wasn't he? Yeah. He was. He had he had published well. He Graham Greene he edited and <laughs> um, Burgess I think, and he had. I'm pretty sure I'm right in saying that he discovered Sylvia Plath. It's not a bad little. It's not a bad. <laughs> um, he he was a, a charming man, James, but he 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 didn't like spending money very much. Um, his or his companies either. Right. And the legend is that he he read Sylvia Plath in a Cambridge undergraduate magazine and invited her down for a half pint of bitter in the French pub in Soho, and then made her a very modest offer. But uh, these these publishing stories are probably there's it's probably half true. That's yeah, right. well, exactly. How, how how quickly did you how long did you stay at the school before you got the when you I think you were picking up some freelance reviewing work and then yes. you get a job as a diary reporter on the Telegraph. That's right. Um, I was at the school for t- two and a half years, okay. I think. And it, was there any panic that you were? sort of stuck or no uh, I felt fine I I wanted to be I I suppose my reasoning was if I can't make it as a novelist which at that point seemed that I wasn't able to right um, I'll be a journalist because at least that's writing yes at least it's typing yeah Yeah. 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 Um, and I managed to get this very very junior job at the Telegraph and I kind of fitted in there okay because um I liked the hours, 10 till 6. I'm a bit of a slow starter, and 10 till 6 worked very well for me. Plus, the work was really not at all demanding. Yeah, I probably went to one event a day, and you just wrote down a couple of jokes in the speech and went back to the office, typed it out. And Did you, you not have to do parties in the evening? Uh, very little in the this evening. This Peterborough, was it? Yeah, that's right. Very little in the evening, occasionally. Right. Um, and um, sometimes they give you a press release, and you would ring people up and try and get behind the puff and into us if these are a story here of some kind. It was all very friendly, <clears throat> light touch stuff. But so at six o'clock, I'd zoom off home. And, you know, I really was not tired at all. And would you write? I would then write. So the it was this quite a, I mean, would you have a routine, a proper routine? Or? Uh, no, but uh, it depends. It, all these routines depend if you actually, if you've got a book on the go. And a lot of the time, at any stage in in your life, you don't have a book on the go. I mean, right. yes, um, you're thinking about the next one, or you're publicising the last one, or you're in a barren spell, or whatever it might be. So, and and then you, as, as we've established, you you um, try to get the, the job on. It'd be Mandrake, would it? The diary on the Correct, Sunday yeah. Telegraph, and yeah. then and then uh, get, get, go across instead as a feature writer from from eighty three to eighty six. Yeah. So. That still, I think the girl at the Leon Door was eighty nine. So you're yeah. You're I actually had written it before then, but there oh, okay. was a, there was a I, I finished it in eighty six, but there was a, a hiccup around its publication, which meant it was delayed. Right, um, commercial sort of thing, or uh, but just a hiccup. Okay, it's intriguing. <laughs> mm. um, and and so now it's sort of all coming together, really, isn't it? I, I think you joined the Independent as literary editor shortly afterwards, so you're, you're, you're soon to be established as a as a novelist with the second one, yeah. and you've got this not at all bad day job as well to keep yeah, the door. Yeah, I mean, the, door. Uh, the, t- the Telegraph was sold um, by the Hartwell family to Conrad Black, um, and there was a change of editor, and the people who'd looked after me, and I'd been there rather sort of special project in a way they've been terribly nice to me and give me all the nice stories to do they both retired or left right and the new editor peregrine Worsthorn, offered me a swanky sounding job as a europe editor but neither he nor i could really work out what that might entail and meanwhile this new paper was starting up the independent and it just sounded too good a chance to miss and various people i knew were going there and uh so i uh, applied for the job of literary editor um which I got, um, and it was, it was great. It was a tremendous experience starting the first new daily paper this country had had since the 1920s. Um, but my job stopped being a guy with a notebook in his hand mm. uh, asking people questions and sitting on the telephone or going to various places and having meetings with them. And I became a sort of computer operative, really. Yes. So, you know, we'd stopped all the typewriters and the printing presses, and now everything was on a system called ATEX, which was an American computer newspaper system. And I found that quite... Um, I found it so stressful and, um, I, you know, I really preferred feature writing. But, you know, I, I couldn't just walk away and I stuck at it. And uh, the paper started to do pretty well. And our books department was considered it was, quite it? successful. Yes. I mean, you know, the competition was really poor. I mean, mm. the Times had almost given up. The Telegraph was 
quite stuck in the mud. The Guardian was very, very dull. And, you know, we, we started off with the top of the page, a lead review of, of the new John Updike novel written by A.S. Byatt. And no one could remember a book's page at which the first, uh, the lead review had been a novel. Novels were normally really? reviewed in little roundups down yes. the bottom of the page. This week's fiction, right. two paragraphs on each by some old lady sucking a peppermint. <laughs> um, well, I make that. And some of lots course. of old gentlemen sucking peppermints as well. But um, So that was good. And it, it actually caused everyone else to wake up and realize that books coverage is very cheap. And, yeah. and, you know, pretty entertaining or not. And, and you ended up deputy editor of the whole paper, I think. Of the Sunday paper. Yeah, in the fact, Independent yeah. on Sunday. Yeah. That doesn't sound like a natural progression from what you've just said. Were you, were you very good at, uh, at being a computer jockey? Is that what is it? Uh, I was OK at it. And then I, I stopped and I did a bit of feature writing as well. I mean, I didn't stop running the books pages, no. but I, I did that on the side. Um, and But then the Independent on Sunday, that was just more endless meetings, which right. was quite tedious, actually. Now, uh, so your, your your novels, I was thinking when you mentioned that, that Cambridge approach, the puritanical approach, or the very serious approach to, to, to studying English, it, I was thinking before I sat down with you that it, 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 there may have been parts of you with the interest you've developed since that, that would have rather studied something else at university. I mean, not, it's not psychology necessarily because mm. that wasn't really a academic subject at that at mm. that level at that time. But but when did this sort of, it's a chicken and egg question really, the fascination with the things that you have subsequently become fascinated with mm. develop and how much of that is driven by the thought that well, that would be good material as well. How much of it is a genuine, would you be fascinated in if you were a bus driver and how much of it is? Uh, it's a good question. Uh, it, it's it's push and pull, chicken and yeah. egg. But uh, I mean, certainly I, I didn't, I would probably have been better off reading archaeology and anthropology yeah. or history. Or psychology, I think, actually was available as a degree, probably, maybe in a conjunction with other things. Yeah. It's a surprisingly difficult subject, actually, I think. I mean, I think certainly at A-level it's considered extremely difficult. Um, but, uh, no, English was, you know, that's what I was good at, and so that's what I sure. did. Um, but then I suppose what happened was that as I began to write these books, at the time you don't really understand what your abiding preoccupations are. You right. go from one book to another. It's only when you look back and you can then see, oh yeah, these all have something in common. What they're all really about is, and I think the first lot of books I wrote, including The Girl at the Lyon d'Or, Charlotte Grey, Birdsong, one or two others, were really about trying to orientate myself. Um, we were talking earlier on about my father's generation and grandfather's generation and I want and I was the child of the Cold War mm. and I want to know how on earth did we get into this terrible mess you know here we are living in this nice little village in this cozy house and um, the world's about to blow itself to pieces in mutually assured destruction mm. so however many many times mum and dad tuck you up in bed and say everything's all right you think well not really <laughs> so I think a lot of the earlier books were about how do we you know who are we and yes. how do we get here and one of the things I concluded at the end of it all was that we are a very, humans are a pretty odd species. And obviously we are super clever and we have achieved things which other creatures will never manage uh, in science and exploration and walking on the moon and understanding the universe. Um, but we are also very violent and we are very fragile and a lot of us suffer from you know, different kinds of dementia and illusions and delusions. Uh, so I think a lot of the next run of books I wrote, including Human Traces, Engleby, Snow Country, and one or two others, are really about not who are we, but what are we? Right, what, yes. what is the mechanism and, and how does it work and how does it not work? From, from the perspective of wanting to understand why we do ridiculous and horrible things. Yes. Um, yeah, exactly. And... Uh, wondering whether our abilities to do um, our, so our superpowers, if you were, come at the cost. Uh, and this leads you into genetics, which as a sort of non-scientist is quite a difficult area to go in, into. But I think that science, particularly biology, is it's quite easy to sort of have a, a saloon bar grasp of it. You can talk about the big ideas of right. the human genome and yeah. 
this, that and the other. And as for the sort of, you know, the molecular stuff, if you haven't had a proper training, that's always going to be slightly confusing, the difference between an acid and a protein and a nucleus and a molecule. You know, to the, us non-scientists, these are all just tiny little things. Really. <laughs> but not, I mean, not confusing to the point of daunting. I mean, you, you wanted to tackle this stuff. You want yeah. to tackle this stuff. Yeah, I mean, uh, I got very into the idea of... Um, the, the origins of, of psychiatry and psychology, which I wrote about in Human Traces, and the, the essential question then in the late 19th century at the time of Freud and ever since, really, has been, are serious uh, mental illnesses caused by um, a, a sort of a genetic or, <coughs> or other biological issue? So are they just really versions of multiple sclerosis or versions of Parkinson's disease? Or are they um, an ordinary person's response to the events of their lives? Right. And so that is to oversimplify it a great deal. But of course. It, but it was oversimplified a great deal. And there was a polar opposite of the, what they called the biological or medical model on one side and then the psychological model on the other. Um, so I looked into all that and that led me, obviously, to look at how how we had evolved as a, as a human species and h how you could really explain the the fact that we are so much cleverer than we really need to be. I mean, normally in natural selection, in order to survive and prosper, you need to discover a niche um, in, in nature that you can inhabit uh, and breed um, and eat and survive. Um, but in order to out outbreed and out-eat our um, competitors, we didn't really need to have built... Uh, Salisbury Cathedral or the Sydney Opera House or indeed have walked on the moon. W which is where consciousness comes into the yeah. picture. Yes, people, there's a lot of um, difference of opinion uh, among biologists and ethologists and philosophers and neuroscientists about what are the what is the distinctive quality of human modern human beings. And some people talk about um, culture, language, tool making, art and so on. But everyone can always say, well, actually, you know, chimpanzees use tools mm. as well. There are birds who set fires, set fire to forests in order to drive out prey. Um, other people have kinds of culture and so on and so forth. And there's never really going to be a consensus about what makes us different. Uh, I suppose the consensus really is that we don't have any one special characteristic. The differences are one of degree, not of kind. There's not one magic human bullet mm. that we have that other people don't have. And yet, and yet, I think maybe there is. <laughs> and to me, the, the extraordinary thing is this, this weird consciousness that we have, this reflective self-consciousness, the ability to be both in and out of consciousness at the same time. I mean, one goes through quite a lot of life without really being thinking sure. what you're doing. Yeah. And you, know, you can drive a car and make highly dangerous and difficult decisions without really thinking about it, because actually you're talking to someone next to you yeah. about the Hundred Years' War. Um, and I sort of suppose that there is some weird link which may well have come about in a completely normal natural selection way. There was a mutation. Uh, it formed that it caused this link to develop in our brains. And then that that gave its possessor an advantage. And therefore, that individual had more offspring and then very rapidly blah 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 came to dominant well yeah, yeah exactly. completely so, so i think i think human traces and snow country is an incomplete trilogy at the yeah. moment yeah that the seventh sun is not i mean it's, it's set seven years it begins seven years hence yeah. it begins in 2030 but it is it's more of a piece with that with those two books in terms of trying to understand how the mind works yeah than it is with I and mean, we've glossed over birdsong changing everything and giving mm. you the freedom to, to to but these are bits of your story that are known already so mm. I'm, I'm less interested in. Well, first of all, it must have been very exciting to suddenly be like you know the, one of the most fated authors in the country. It, yeah, it was. It, it was good. <laughs> yes, and it's given you the, the yeah, obviously exactly. the freedom to do to do the subsequent work. So with the new book, it it has to be set in the future because the I'm, I, I, I don't want to say the wrong thing here because it is it's a twisty it, yeah. book and it, and it is. So I don't know what you're comfortable having in the public eye about the central premises and about the... Well, but it's set seven years in the future, largely yeah. because of fertility technology, yeah. not quite perhaps being ready yet to deliver the yeah. plot it's, it's a high It's a high concept. Yes. Um, it's a what if, and it's a what if uh, this um, a, a breeding took place between 
uh, A and B, um, two different kinds of human, really, you would say. Um, and it could happen now. The, the, right. It could happen now, um, but it'd be a bit more likely as, you know, it's a very, very rapidly evolving world genetics. Yeah. Uh, and, and so is um, archaeology and anthropology, actually. We're finding new human species all the time. Mm. And I invent, not all the time, that's a terrible exaggeration. But, uh, <laughs> it's only just last Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, I invent one in the book, and I think it's quite feasible. We will discover more. My advisors, my scientific advisors said, look, if you start it in 2030, mm. then it'll be absolutely bang on. And everyone who knows anything about this will say, yeah, yeah, that's fine, that's fine, that's fine. Um, and then we go on, by the time the main character, Seth, who is the child who's born in the fertility clinic as a result of this slight interference uh, that has taken place there. He's 25 at the end of the book, so by then we're in 2055. Um, and when I was dealing with the later chapters, um, I did think it would be quite fun, really, to imagine what the world might look like then. Mm. And my basic bet is it won't look much different from the way it is now. And that's because if you look back 30 years, I don't think very much has changed. Well, with the one massive exception, of course, of we all carry around a mobile phone and have access to the internet all the yes. time. And of course, that's a big change. But for the rest, it's still rail strikes, air traffic control, the weather, the football results, the, the happiness of your family and friends and so on. Um, so a lot of people therefore say that Seventh Son, oh gosh, it, you've gone all science fiction. Is this it? And the answer is yes and no. It's to me, Charlotte Gray is a novel that happens to be set in the 1940s. Mm. And uh, The Seventh Son is a novel that happens to be set in the 2040s. Um, I don't see Charlotte Gray as historical fiction. I don't see this as science fiction, but I don't, it doesn't really matter what people call it as long as they're interested by it. And the story which does actually rattle along quite fast. Yes, it does. And what, wh where did that... I mean, I, I, again, I, I don't want to give, give anything away, but there have been scientific discoveries that it's hard for me to pinpoint whether they happened after you'd come up with this idea or whether they perhaps spawned some of this idea, like, like sort of d discovering how much... What, what, what humans are made of, what, what Homo sapiens consists yeah. of, and things like that. Well, I was very struck um, after I'd finished Human Traces and sort of got myself up to speed on, you know, elementary genetics and <laughs> elementary Homo sapiens, what, what we are, just to discover in 2010, uh, around then, that we had interbred with Neanderthals yeah. because we believed we were, you know, an, an exceptional um, species. Um, and I did one of those spit-in-a-tube tests did and you? sent it off to... Mm. Sweden, and I came back um, three and a half percent Neanderthal. <laughs> oh, blind! This is pretty exciting, <laughs> it is, actually, because yeah. most of the rest of it had been, you know, London and home counties, and <laughs> a bit of German, a bit, a little bit of Spanish, but not much. Uh, and so, yeah, it, this this is a field in which things are changing. But in in the book, in the Seventh Son, there's I have invented one or two things, uh, like the new human species, which is discovered in a cave in um, Western France, in Brittany. And I have discovered a, 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 new, a breakthrough in brain scanning, which enables them to see exactly how consciousness is, is working and the nature of the link between your self-awareness of yourself as a body, which is just a momentary thing, mm. and your access to memory, which is what then fleshes it out and gives us the superior intellectual power. There's also, and again, it's hard to pinpoint how much of it presages or, or what 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 has happened since you started writing the book and how much of it possibly reflects what had already happened you've got quite a there's a, a major character in it who is you know a, a, a kind of not quite a bond villain but but uh got a good there's a god complex of sorts going on there and it is a, a sort of entrepreneur who yeah. has he's a tech um billionaire yeah who um, people will say Elon Musk, won't they, or, 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 or elements of Elon Musk? Well, I mean, I think there, there are elements in the way he behaves, which mm. are he sees himself as sort of beyond normal considerations. Yes, exactly. Whether they are financial, economic, or ethical or moral, and he wants to live forever. But uh, I try to keep him away from too much of a stereotype. So I've made mm. him Australian, and he talks. He doesn't talk in tech speak at all. He talks a bit like a sheep shearer, in fact. <laughs> um, and also, I try to make it uh, that his his argument is is a feasible one. I yeah. mean, he doesn't put it in so many words, but it would be: look, 
Homo sapiens in Europe alone has killed something like 100 million people for no reason in the last 100 years. Okay, that's that. What we're doing with this kid, Seth, is he's, a, he's healthy, he's well, he has nice parents, he goes to a perfectly good local school, uh, he actually gets into university. He may face some difficulties later in his life. Well, so what? Mm -hmm. You know, you put those two things in the balance. And, you know, but it does ask, of course, ethical questions about scientific experiments. Um, can, you, is, can you sacrifice one for the greater good of the many? And especially if that good is not, you're not actually sure you're going to find out a lot. And this character, Lucas Pan, he is motivated by a desire to help his father, his aged father, who's got dementia. Uh, but of course, it's not really clear that anything they discover from examining Seth and his life will really lead them to a direct cure for these things. But he's just trying, really. Mm. He's, sort of he's trying, but you, you're free to doubt whether... He, he's, he sees himself as a philosophical disruptor of yes. all these rather grand things, but you're free to say you're just a big swinging fool, really, aren't you? And um, it's up to you to decide whether you like him or not. It's, it's, it, it reflects a fairly bleak view of humanity, doesn't it? The whole world, I mean, humankind rather than, than humanity, but also the sort of... Um, I read you said something recently about the Neand Neanderthals lasted about three hundred thousand years, and mm. we're unlikely to match that. I would th I would think so. Yes, the Neanderthals were very very hardy people, um, and they survived in extraordinary climatic uh, extremes, mostly to do with ice ages and so on. Uh, and we believe that they were reasonably civilized and that they could speak. Um, we don't know for sure. They buried their dead. Um, and, you know, they must have been sufficiently um, s simpatico yes. that we bred with them. I mean, you and I both have Neanderthal ancestors. Yes. So, you know, our sapiens forefathers and foremothers obviously thought they were OK people. Um, but um, they didn't have, it seems, we, we don't know, but it seems they didn't have the extreme drive of Homo sapiens. Uh, I was when I was researching the last bit of the book, which I wanted to take place sort of somewhere at the end of the earth. Um, I went to the Outer Hebrides and I was trying to get to a very uninhabited island. I couldn't get to because of the weather. But all the time you ask yourself, God, it's bad enough here in the sort of wilds of South Harris. Why would you want to go to an uninhabited <laughs> island as well? And it's because human beings always will. Yes, if it's there, they'll conquer it. Mm. Uh, and. There's there's a bit in the in the book when Talissa, who is the surrogate mother, who is the other main character in the book, imagines an early meeting between a Neanderthal group somewhere in the on the Asian steppe and a group of Homo sapiens who've completed a long thousand year or more, ten thousand year trip up north out of Africa, and they arrive one evening at the sort of corral or stockade, and um, the the they look at these new humans and they think well they're not that big and we could beat them up easily enough but there's just something about them they're so it's pointless to resist them because they're always going to get what they want okay. so you might as well mate with them be with them follow them and join with them and that's speculation but it's not completely unscientific no um finally almost finally quite often authors when they finish a book they, you know, it's finished. But the themes that you're interested in now, I'd say that they're still whirling around your head all the time, aren't they? Mm -hmm. So you don't you don't park uh, the, this book and stop thinking about this stuff at all. No, and uh, and I suppose it's such a it's such as we were saying before uh, a field where so much is moving so quickly. Mm -hmm. But I don't really want to write another book like this. I really don't. Um, it was quite hard work in a way. Uh, you know, science was hard. Because um, you had to have your homework marked it, all the time. Yeah. yeah. I mean, at one point I did actually buy um, the A-level biology student's revision guide. Um, and that's, it's quite complicated, you know. No, I people, I'm not supposed to say as if I'll be surprised. People are sort of so <laughs> sniffy about, no, you know, no. A-levels and grades. But, no. yeah, boy, you know, anyone who gets a grade A in that has my Fair admiration. Enough. Um, and we, we mentioned ambition earlier, and and you know the fact that every every writer has it. I presume you've you've realised most of yours. Have you realised all of them? Um, you, you're always hoping that you'll write that one book that just eludes you, that one sort of perfect thing, which is 
so interesting and so full of the thoughts that you have, but it's also so easy and and charming to read, and sort of, so it's like a, a sort of a fabulous cocktail which tastes so zingy and fresh and sweet and cold, but it's only when it's inside your system and your head starts to explode. Uh, so I'm still hoping for that great cocktail book. Sebastian Fawkes, thank you. Pleasure.